The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to Repro Action's Act and Learn webinar for the month of June 2018. Tonight is a very important topic and we have a number of excellent panelists here to break down for us why immigration is a reproductive justice issue. So your hosts tonight are the formidable co-founders and co-directors of Repro Action. The first voice you're hearing is myself. I'm Erin Matson. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia. And I am Pamela Merritt, and I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. So the agenda for tonight is a quick introduction of Repro Action to those of you who are new to our webinars. And then we're going to launch right into um, discussion and presentation from our panelists. We have Margie Dale Castillo, we have Nancy Cardenas Pena, Tina Vasquez, and Rose Berry. And then after um, the final presentation, there'll be a brief bit of um, housekeeping for next steps. And then we're going to have time for a Q&A at the end. And then we adjourn promptly at 8, 8 o'clock Eastern. The hashtag for live tweeting is pound reproaction. So ReproAction is a new direct action group that formed to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are so proud of our left flank analysis, of our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, whether they identify as allies or the opposition, and of our commitment to nonviolent direct action. All right, great. So first, to get started with our panel discussion, we're going to have Margie Del Castillo, who's Director of Field and Advocacy for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, based in Virginia, um, join us. So first, I'll give an introduction from Margie. As I said, she just serves, serves as the Director of Field and Advocacy for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, where she is responsible for building the base of activists willing to take action on issues developing community leadership, building relationships with key local, state, and national stakeholders, and advancing civic engagement strategies. Margie has been an activist and an organizer for the past six years, working alongside communities of color around diverse social justice issues. Most recently, Margie held the position of National Field Coordinator at the Alliance for Citizenship, a national campaign focused on winning common sense immigration reform. Margie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you to ReproAction and everyone for being here today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start, and I have a few slides for you all to look at here. Um, and first, I just have here the definition that we work with at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health of reproductive justice. And I'm going to take a second to read that. So everyone, regardless of race, age, ability, national origin, income, sexual orientation, or gender expression, has equal rights and access to reproductive health services, as well as the right to make informed decisions about whether or when to have children. Next slide. Reproductive justice will be attained when all people have the economic, social, and political power to make decisions about their bodies, sexuality, health, and family with dignity and self-determination. And I just want to acknowledge um, the contributions of organizations like Sister Song and Forward Together in helping to develop this framework. Next slide. So I wanted to read those to you all because because this is actually part of a presentation that we do um, in our community spaces and in the states that we organize in, uh, which is Virginia, Florida, Texas, and New York, where we talk about what are all of the issues that impact a person's ability to decide when or when they may have a family, right? Um, and this little design right here is actually something that we will draw in a room with folks um, to help them see that there's so many issues that impact a person's life, right? Issues like housing, abortion access, health care access, economic equality, and the one that's bolded here today is immigration, because that's what we're here to talk about. So I want to go to the next slide, please. So we have here the topic of xenophobia. I don't want to spend a ton of time focusing on myths and stereotypes about our people. There's enough of this in the society for me to repeat it. But I really want to quickly mention that xenophobia against immigrants shapes our society's perception of who we are, who our families are, our parents, 
and our children. It, it helps for folks to see undocumented immigrant families as not legitimate families, right? You see the image here on the screen of an anchor baby. That is an offensive term that refers to this idea that immigrants are coming to U.S. soil to have children that will literally anchor them to this country and give them some form of legitimacy. There's so many things wrong with that, <laughs> but um, in one way that I would like to point out here is that it helps this image of seeing our parents as reproducers, right? For as people that are just coming to have children so that they can come here and take advantage of all of these mythical benefits that are available to immigrants that are actually not um, not the case and not able to be accessed. So it, help, it hurts the ability for our folks to be welcomed into spaces like schools, hospitals, it uh, impacts their interactions with government and interactions with each other's and their neighbors, right? It makes women scared to be able to go get prenatal care, or often not even be able to access it because of their status. This idea also that immigrants come to the U.S. to have children is very, is very heteronormative, right? It, it thinks of a family as a mother and a father, and it, it really puts that um, single lens onto folks and onto families when we know that families are really different. Um, the reality is that not, not all immigrants have children here. Many never have children. Many are working here to support children that are still living in their home countries, right? And ultimately, many families come in different shapes and sizes. So it would also speak to the fact that the way we think about families and immigration and the way we shape policies that Suppose or supposedly will be providing relief for them isn't that broad and we need to be able to broaden it so that all of our folks are included. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of like some of that xenophobia that's out there um, and that really impacts the way we see immigrants in our society. Next slide. Okay, so mass incarceration. What is one of the biggest threats to immigrant families right now? It's mass incarceration, right? And mass incarceration is a really big umbrella term for a lot of different things that are impacting our communities, and not just immigrants, but all people of color overall in the US. But this includes detention, it includes deportation, it includes law enforcement and interactions with police, it includes navigating the criminal justice system, the treatment that people receive in detention, and the lack of access to care often found in detention. In mass incarceration settings, we've seen that many incarcerated women have been shackled while giving birth. They've gone through sexual assault and rape. They've had their children, both citizen and non-citizen, taken away and put in foster care proceedings or deported along with their parents. It leaves our communities afraid to seek services because anything could put them into the deportation proceedings, leaving often people to live in isolation and fear. It leads to our immigrant communities not calling police for help, especially if you're a black immigrant and what that means to call the police in the day that we live in now. It also leaves our communities lacking in support and services, lacking in rights and protections. And it also relies heavily on the bad immigrant versus good immigrant narrative, which unfortunately our immigration movement has helped to reinforce the stereotype of what a good immigrant looks like and therefore having to have a stereotype of what a bad immigrant looks like, right? And so we work on, you know, we work with those stereotypes and we unfortunately uplift certain immigrant experiences and not others. Next slide. So one example I wanted to give here of kind of the interaction between immigration and reproductive justice to really cement and show you all how it is an issue of reproductive justice is something that happened in 2015. We have a woman named Blanca Borrego who went to a gynecologist appointment in Texas with her two daughters. When she went to this appointment, the clinic staff told her that she needed to update her records. And so she showed a false ID, which is the only thing that she could access being undocumented. The clinic staff then chose to take the ID and go into the back room and have Blanca and her children in the waiting room while they called the police department, who eventually arrested Blanca. Blanca was charged with a felony related to a false social security card that the sheriff found in her purse after the arrest. So that was a that 
was a situation that made national news. A lot of folks, it came to their radar because we assume that locations like the health, a health center, a school, a daycare, a church, we, re we assume that those are spaces that are safe for our folks. And maybe once upon a time they were, but in this heightened climate that we're in now, and even back in 2015, we realized that it's actually not, right? Our folks are not safe. And how does how is this an intersection of RJ and immigration? Blanca was literally there to receive gynecological care, right? And going to a place to access care where she thought she would be safe, she ends up being detained. So how are immigrant women expected to trust health professionals and to seek out support and medical care that they need? Blanca and her family had lived in the US for over 12 years. She had one US citizen son and two children who qualified for DACA. Ultimately, her family was working with local community organizations to help keep the staff accountable at the clinic and to help educate these clinics, right? To show that they are spaces that need to be safe for our community so that they can access care. But this is one really clear example of the intersection of reproductive justice and immigration. Next slide. Thank you. And now we find ourselves in not a new situation, um, something that has happened many times before, but something that ha is on the minds of everyone and, and blasting all over our news cycles and our feeds, this issue of refugees coming to our country and children being separated from their parents. We have this quote here on the screen that's super powerful. I'm sure most of you have seen it, but I'll read it. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And that's so that's so key, especially for folks that want to make the argument of why are people coming to this country? Why aren't they doing it the legal way, right? The quote unquote legal way. It shows a lot of ignorance um, to how the actual immigration system works, which I know my fellow presenters will go into more detail after mine, so I won't go into too much right now. Um, but it shows a lot of ignorance as to actually what legal proceedings there are available for people, what avenues are actually available. A lot of people don't know that it can take up to 22 years to petition for a family member to come and get a green card, right? That's just one example of how broken our immigration system is. Um, and meanwhile, we have these situations where folks are fleeing violence, true violence and true danger in their everyday lives in their countries of, of origin and coming here for respite and for safety and for care and to be reunited with families that, ex that already live here and having their children torn away and ripped apart from them and now being jailed in these baby jails, right? So this is something that, you know, we're gonna go on into more here in the, in the call, but I just wanted to touch on that for right now to kind of set what other people will be talking about in more in detail. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what now? A lot of people, and not just right now, but over the last few years, have seen that um, federally there's not a lot of uh, opportunities for us for, for advancement in the cause of immigrant justice. So a lot of people have been taking to state and local battles and seeing what they can do in their communities. Um, I live in Virginia, and one of the things that we've been talking about here among people who really care about immigrant justice and who want to see and do something is researching, right? So seeing what exists in our state. We know that we have a, a large adult detention center in Farmville, Virginia. We know that we even have one of these quote unquote tender age shelters in Northern Virginia. Um, these are things that exist right in our backyard. And so that's some of the, you know, uh, there's a lot of energy around donating money um, to organizations on the border, right, in Texas and Arizona who have been doing this work for a really long time. And I think that's one very concrete way that you can immediately help is by donating financially. Um, but also I would really suggest to folks to think about how to do something locally. Find out where your local ICE office is, find out where detention centers ex exist, and get together with people who have been doing this work on the ground in your state, your local immigrant rights organizations, and see what can be done that's most effective to fight against this right now. Um, the next slide. And the last thing I wanna mention before my time is up um, is that this isn't just a Latinx issue, right? These are the images that we see are of Central American folks 
and Latino folks being concerned about this, but we know that immigrants come in many different races from many different countries. This is not just a Latino issue. And the one thing I wanted to leave you all was on uh, exciting partnerships that are coming up and that have been in the works for a few years now. Um, the Movement for Black Lives released their vision and platform for justice, and they included an end to all deportations and repealing the 1996 immigration laws that created the foundation for our current mass incarceration and deportation system. And that's an exciting development. It's not, you know, they did this a couple of years ago and there's been um, movement with different coalitions in the environmental justice field, in climate justice, and in, um, in economic justice. So many different folks moving cross movement together and building to be able to work on this issue. And we know that we need to do this. We need to be joining together to fight um, Trump to fight these racist and xenophobic policies because that's the only way that we're going to win is by building together. So I hope that you'll go out there and find your local groups working on this and see what you can do locally in your neighborhood. All right. Thank you so much, Margie. We appreciate it. And everyone, please put any questions you have for Margie in the chat box. We'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. And I'll pass it back to Pamela. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you, Margie. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Cardenas Pena, who is the Texas Latina Advocacy Network Associate Director for State Policy and Advocacy at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, Nancy works at the intersection of immigration and reproductive health care. She also serves on the board of NARAL Pro Choice Texas, a political strong arm of reproductive health care policies, and the Frontera Fund, an abortion fund that serves people of the Rio Grande Valley. Nancy is the daughter of Mexican immigrant parents from Nuevo Leon in Tamaulipas. Uh, Nancy works during the Texas legislative session against reproductive um, uh, health care and immigration bills that harm Latinx communi communities, advocating for the passage of policies at the local level with a decriminalization lens and deportation defense campaigns to support the undocumented community under the framework of abolishing corrupt institutions like ICE. And I am thrilled, we are totally thrilled at ReproAction that Nancy serves on our advisory council. Welcome, Nancy. Hi, thank you for having me. I hope everyone can hear me. Totally can hear you and it's our pleasure. Um, so let's dive right on in. Um, I, I think one of the things that I noticed on Twitter today is a lot of, oh, of course, <laughs> of course, a lot of people um, seem to think that ICE is a bedrock founding part of, you know, the American landscape and has been around for over 300 years. So for those who aren't familiar with the history of ICE, when was ICE created and how has it changed life in America? Yeah, so um, this could easily be a conversation that lasts hours and hours um, when we can start talking about the policies and the institutions that administrations have created to criminalize communities across the US. But basically, um, ICE was created in 2003. It was created pursuant to something called the Homeland Security Act. And the Homeland Security Act was basically a bipartisan effort after 9-11 um, to pass some sort of reform um, around immigration um, lens. So it was um, created under George W. Bush. And the institution um, as ICE that we see today basically has two sort of spectrums. It has the sort of enforcement um, part of it, and it has the investigations part of ICE. So when we talk about immigration, we're not just talking about ICE. We're talking about so many different institutions that enforce deportations and have this enforcement lens. But yes, we ICE has not existed for 300 years. ICE um, has around 15 years of existence. Um, it was created with an old administration and reinforced um, through different administrations in both uh, the Democratic and Republican side. 
Um, so yes, um, as unbelievable as it may seem to some folks, we can definitely exist without this institution and we're doing so for quite some time. Thank you for that. Um, so as, as you hinted at and you were talking about misinformation, there's so much misinformation out there about family separation and some real harm is being done um, and insults are being tossed out by people who identify as allies. And I know you've spoken out um, about a dialogue occurring around family separation. Um, and I hope that you can share some of your thoughts specifically about um, what is helpful, what's not helpful, the, you know, the history of family separation, um, and also the, the geography of family separation. Um, so if you could just share some of the thoughts that you've been sharing in social spaces about those issues. Yeah, so um, this was also expressed on the Twitter. <laughs> um, as a lot of ideas are, um, but I was seeing a lot of misinformation from people who called themselves our allies. And uh, one of the hardest things to explain to folks was that the deportation machine that we see today um, was created through a variety of different administrations with both Democrats and Republicans. So sometimes the rhetoric took a tone of, well, this hateful institution and this policy um, was came into place because of the Trump administration, and that's just not the case. The only reason why the Trump administration is able to employ such a vast uh, institution and so many deportations and separations is because Democrats and Republicans before kind of upheld and sustained this institution for it to do what it does today. Um, this didn't just happen overnight. This has been happening for quite some time. And so I was born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, and I have a lot of family members who do not have papers. Um, and we've been seeing all of this for such a long time. And so when it came to issues like uh, the vacant Walmart, that the organization in Southwest Keys was using um, to detain all of those children, which we saw all of the pictures of, we actually brought it to folks' attention several years ago because we knew that they were actively seeking permits within the city of Brownsville and the county. Mm. Um, it didn't really, you know, grab everyone's attention like pictures did recently with um, incarcerating um, children. But we have been talking about this for quite some time, um, especially in areas like the Rio Grande Valley. So a lot of the rhetoric was like, well, what is the Rio Grande Valley doing? I mean, these institutions have existed. And yes, yes, these institutions have existed. Yes, we have been working on these issues for quite some time. And these institutions actually exist in some shape or form in your own backyards. So it isn't just the border that's experiencing family separation issues. It is our own backyards and whatever cities we may come from that are experiencing um, some sort of family separation. And so another thing that I really wanted to sort of ingrain in folks is that family separation doesn't always necessarily look like children being in cages. It can also look like the administration uh, deporting families, ripping families apart. And this exists wherever we may be. Um, mm. So yes, this issue has been happening for quite some time. Thank you so much for that. Um, in the time that we have left, um, if you could just talk more a little bit about your work and what would be helpful for allies and activists to do in support. Yeah, so um, I think like my bio expressed, um, I do work at the Texas legislative session, uh, which some say that I'm a glutton for punishment, but <laughs> here I go. Um, we did fight some previous bills regarding family detention. Um, and one of those bills which HB 2225, which was basically giving the state of Texas power to expedite child licensing for detention centers in Texas. Um, luckily that did die during the session, but like I said, 
this has appeared in some shape or form, um, and this has been going on for quite some time. Recently, um, one of the most um, recent endeavors that I have undertaken is a deportation defense campaign for a woman named Eva Chavez, who is a poderosa, someone who works within the institution and is a fantastic leader for the Rio Grande Valley community, who was targeted by immigration, by border patrol, and by the local sheriff's department. And she was going to be deported, uh, but we interjected and we created a campaign. Um, we have a defense fund for folks, and we really wanted to um, enforce that, you know, family separations and deportations and this work was going on for quite some time in the Rio Grande Valley. So Eva was scheduled for several check-ins with immigration, and um, we have managed to have some pretty successful accompaniment programs where Eva doesn't have to go in alone. Um, we, we've held ICE accountable and we have flooded their um, hotline numerous amount of times in order for them to let Eva stay. And so we've had some success doing that and we foresee that we're continuing in some shape or form. You know, I've also dealt with uh, several other cases where Border Patrol have held folks for extended periods of time. And so also investigating and finding people um, for family members who may have questions or are worried about where they may be and what jurisdiction they're being detained under. Um, so it's been a sort of a roller coaster around family separation and still continuing to do the work um, for these deportation defense campaigns. Thank you so much. Um, if you'll hang on, and uh, I know we're going to have a very um, involved Q&A at the end, but thank you so much, Nancy, and I'll turn it back thank over you. to you. All right. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you, Nancy. Always a pleasure to be joined by an advisory council member and a leader in our organization, too. Um, so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Tino Vasquez, who is a senior reporter covering immigration at Rewire.News. She has 10 years of experience writing about immigrant rights, racial justice, and feminism. Tina is a definitive voice, and if you're not following her work on Rewire, I encourage you to start doing so immediately following this webinar. So thank you for joining us tonight, Tina. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thrilled to have you here. So let's dive right in. So you recently published an amazing Q&A with immigration attorneys titled The Oppressive Regime We're Now Living Under. And I think that title is a fitting way to begin our discussion. What do people need to know about access to care while in detention or the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement? I mean, like Nancy, I think um, providing context is very important. And so um, while there have been really unprecedented attacks of young people under the Trump administration in the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, I think it's really important to start by understanding that there is ongoing litigation against ORR that dates back to the Obama administration. So essentially, the Obama administration was giving um, religiously affiliated shelters millions of dollars to um, basically shelter unaccompanied immigrant minors. And so young people in those shelters, um, whether it was accessing abortion care or even requesting it or requesting information about it, um, those shelters would throw those young people out. And so that is litigation that's ongoing. I believe oral arguments in that case begin in August. And so, um, you know, while there is a lot of new things, a lot of new bad things going on in OR, like I think that's an important place to start. Um, and then under the Trump administration, I think, um, the biggest change in ORR has been Scott Lloyd. So he's ORR's new director. He's a Trump appointee. Um, he is rabidly anti-choice. Um, he has no qualifications for being director of such an important federal immigration agency that deals with such vulnerable populations. I think like a bulk of his background has to do with um, Catholic organizations and crisis pregnancy centers. Um, so within a few months of being named director of ORR, Scott Lloyd implemented what was basically an abortion ban. So the Jane Doe stories that emerged from ORR, um, young people who wanted to access abortion were basically banned from doing so, at least for a little while, um, because of this policy. Um, 
And so you had instances in which young people had been raped, instances in which people um, that were in Texas who'd gone through the judicial bypass process. Um, Scott Lloyd basically overrid everything and decided that young people in his care um, cannot access abortion. Um, and so I, I would say that definitely Scott Lloyd is, is someone to keep an eye on under this administration. Um, and especially because there are other policies in place that were also implemented in, like very quickly and on the sly. Um, there was an injunction today because of another troubling policy in which um, young people who'd been falsely labeled as gang members were being subjected to prolonged detention because they needed their case to be personally reviewed by Scott Lloyd, but he wasn't telling anyone sort of what procedures or processes were in place for his approval. So you had young people who were just sort of languishing um, in OR custody, being separated from their families for months, and in some cases, um, you know, almost a year, um, with the case of LVM, who's the young person in the class action lawsuit against um, ORR in this particular instance. So he was in detention essentially for eight months um, because his school funneled him. It was like the school to detention pipeline where he was falsely accused of being a gang member. He was funneled into ORR custody from ICE during a raid where he was accused of being an MS-13 member. Um, and so while that might not sort of fall under the umbrella as, as we understand it to be like a reproductive justice issue, um, there are sort of issues that I see as very much related going on in ORR. RR, and they all sort of stem back to Scott Lloyd. Thank you for that. Um, so on that note, there was a, a lot of confusion about the Azar v. Garza case at SCOTUS and the constitutionality of the Office of Refugee Resettlement's policy to block pe young people from accessing abortion care, as you underlined has been happening under Scott Lloyd. Can you provide an update on what that case was about, what the Supreme Court did, and where things stand today? Sure. Um, I, you know, there were a lot of misleading headlines um, in the media about what the recent Supreme Court decision did. And honestly, it didn't change the case in any sort of significant way. Um, I believe that it was the DOJ that was trying to punish Jane Doe's attorneys, uh, the Supreme Court decision decision said that they wouldn't be punished. And essentially Jane Doe, because she was able to access abortion, because she's 18 now, she won't be representing the class. I mean, that's kind of the gist of what happened. So the class action lawsuit is, is moving forward. And the other super, super important thing to note is that the injunction is still in place. So currently young people who are in ORR custody can access abortion. Um, and so I, I, I don't want that to be um, misunderstood or misreported in any way because as the attorneys behind the case told me that, um, you know, should information circulate that young people can't access abortion, young people in custody might be afraid to ask um, given the horrible hoops that young people like Jane Doe had to jump through because of Scott Lloyd's policy. And so young people can access abortion in OR custody. And then the other important thing to know, I think, is that so as this class action lawsuit moves forward and if the ACLU wins the case and basically the terms of the injunction are permanent, which is that young people can access abortion, it basically reverts back, the policies revert back to how they were under the Obama administration, which means that while technically you can access abortion if you're detained by ORR, um, if you're in a religiously affiliated shelter, that shelter still has the right to kick you out for even asking about abortion. Um, so I think that's another important thing to keep in mind as the case sort of moves forward. Thank you for that. And then my final question for you before we get to Q&A, and again, encouragement to everyone to chat any questions you have for Tina into the chat box, and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. So you've also covered Attorney General Jeff Sessions' recent decision to override asylum law and instruct immigration judges to stop granting asylum to most victims of, a, of domestic abuse and gang violence. What do people need to know about this decision? I, mean, I think the most important thing to understand is that primarily this will impact um, Central American asylum seekers. Um, many of whom are women, and increasingly many are indigenous women in particular. So they are fleeing gender-based violence from gangs or um, domestic violence in intimate partner relationships. And so now 
Sessions has basically said that those aren't valid reasons to seek asylum. Um, and that's, uh, I, I don't think there's any articulating how uh, god awful this is because it will directly lead to people dying. Um, I am certain that there have already been instances in which we have deported people to their deaths. Um, I think this is another clear example of how we as a country harm Central Americans because the context that I think is also important to provide is that a lot of the reasons why um, people from Northern Triangle countries are migrating is because of US foreign policy. And so the United States has done things to destabilize places like Honduras and El Salvador. Um, those places can become, as a result, inhospitable for certain people. Those people migrate and we criminalize them for migrating. Um, and so this is kind of like a circle of violence that we're seeing play, play out. And, and you know, a lot of the asylum seekers that are coming to the United States are also the same people who are being told you no longer have this reason to claim asylum. It's no longer valid in the United States. And these are the same people who had their children taken at the border. Um, so it just layers and layers and layers of violence. Um, and while this doesn't really have anything to do directly with, with Sessions' um, decision, I also think it's really important when we're talking about asylum seekers um, to draw attention to cases like Udoka Nueke's. Um, he has experienced multiple injustices. Um, and his case has largely only come to light because of the work of organizations like the Black LGBTQIA Migrant Project and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Um, Udoka is a gay asylum seeker from Nigeria. Um, he has been subjected to prolonged detention in California. He has attempted suicide in custody. He's been diagnosed with a serious mental illness, um, but he still remains detained. And so stories like Udoka's deserve, I think, the same kind of care and attention that we give to other stories surrounding asylum seekers. And I understand that um, right now, because of the family separation policy and because of Sessions' recent decision, it is Latinx communities that are largely having their stories uplifted. Um, but when we talk about asylum seekers, I'd also like to um, expand the conversation if we can so that there are larger understandings of how these policies are playing out for different communities of people. Thank you, Tina. You have given us so much to think about, and it's a clear call to action for people in this country. So thank you. I will pass it back to Pamela to introduce Rose. Thank you very much. Um, Rose Berry is a Black immigrant woman and girls program specialist at Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Um, Rose is a Black Afro-Latinx femme organizer that committed their life to the fight for liberation at the age of 16. They were born in Panama and grew up in Boston, where they organized for 11 years around immigration and women's rights and racial and socioeconomic equity. Rose, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Let's dive right in. Um, but um, I, I want to highlight to folks and we will share it in our follow-up email that you wrote the black immigrant women and girls in the u.s um, report um, and if you could please describe what led you to um to the work that you do and um and in that led to you writing this report sure um Thank you again for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Rose. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her, um, in that order. And as was mentioned, I am the Black Immigrant Women and Girls Program Specialist at the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, or Baji for short. Um, a little bit about myself, I am the daughter of a Black migrant woman who was also the daughter of a Black migrant woman. And so I represent three generations of migration to this country and a deep commitment to transforming myself and the world around me in order to create better conditions for the communities I come from. Um, I started doing social justice work uh, at the age of 16, so um, I've been doing it for about 17 years, uh, committing more than half my life to um, transformative work in the areas of gender justice and migrant justice that centers Black liberation, because it's important that, um, yeah, when we're fighting for justice, 
practice, we're always centering those are at, who are at the margins of the margins. Um, and so that's what brings me to this work. Um, and I was a member of Black Alliance for Just Immigration and Black Immigration Network for many years before coming on onto staff, so I'm very honored to be serving in this capacity um, and serving in a capacity that really brings to light and affirms the different pieces of my own identity as a Black migrant woman myself. Thank you so much for that. Um, so to focus on the report that you wrote, um, I was struck when I read the overview by the section on how ICE is using family courts um, and domestic abuse proceedings to arrest immigrant women. And um, obviously that impacts whether um, people who are um, survivors of domestic abuse um, or are involved in family court proceedings seek support um, when they face that kind of uh, violence and, and um, oversight. So could you just explain more about how that unfolds? Sure, um, and I feel like, um, like you just said, and like folks have spoken to earlier on in the call very eloquently, um, you know, some black immigrant women and girls are migrate, uh, migrant to the US as survivors of gender-based violence, sexual assault, or dangerous relationships. Um, and as mentioned in the report, ICE has been using places like court hearings and hospitals to target migrants. Um, this has caused survivors of gender-based violence to either risk being detained while seeking support and escape from their abusers or not report gender-based assaults at all out of fear that they'll be targeted at those places. Um, and I just wanted to add that you know, some community organizations have really been fighting back by demanding that sanctuary be provided for individuals seeking services at locations such as courthouses, churches, hospitals, and schools. Thank you for that. Um, and again, as you detailed in the report, Black women are highly criminalized. Um, and what, what does that look like? I, I think you obviously covered some of that, but what does that look like for Black immigrant women and girls? Sure, um, that's a really good question. Um, black migrant women, girls, trans women, and trans girls and femmes experience the intersections of xenophobic, uh, racial, and gender oppression simultaneously, uh, right? So we can't like wake up one day and just decide uh, that we're only gonna be a black person today or only gonna be a woman or escape the targeting of migrant communities, um, especially given the current political climate. Um, because the uh, black community is disproportionately impacted by overcriminalization and overincarceration. When you add in the federal administration's avid attack on migrant communities, black migrants are dealing with compounded oppression simultaneously by multiple institutions simultaneously. Um, black girls are one of the fastest growing populations in the juvenile justice system. And while the population of black women in adult prisons has been on the decline since the 80s, black women are still overrepresented in the prison system when compared to their overall population and when compared to the population of white women that our system involves. Um, I'd also add, like to add quickly um, that while in detention, I feel like some folks spoke to this also, but uh, migrant women are being denied access to reproductive health and being told to quote unquote, go back to where they came from in order to gain access to something that should be a human right. Um, likewise, trans women are often forced into detention facilities that do not match their gender or uh, forced into solitary confinement as a mechanism um, that's been proven to cause long lasting trauma and severe strain on mental health. Thank you for highlighting that. Um, it's just devastating to hear. So the report, which again, I'm was we are going to include it in the follow-up email. Um, I just think it's very important that people read through this information. Um, but it seeks to shed light on some of the issues affecting Black immigrant women and girls. And it also seeks to lay the groundwork for deeper engagement in solutions. So since we are an activist organization and we like to give activists um, advice, but also framing in what is helpful, um, if you could share in the few minutes we have left, what are some examples of engagement that is helpful and solutions that are helpful? Uh, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. And I mean, um, again, folks have, um, already lifted up some um, in terms of getting involved locally in your community. There are organizations all over 
um, the country that are thankfully lending their service and their voice to this work. Um, and um, I also just wanted to name that um, because Black women are highly invisibilized in data collection, the intersection of belonging to the migrant community intensifies how invisibilized we become. And so there isn't a lot of data that exists out there, period, which is why organizations like Baji are doing the work to amplify and uplift Black migrant women's stories. Um, I'd also like to add that organizations like BLMP, um, as folks lifted up earlier, the Black LGBTQIA plus migrant project, um, which I also am honored and privileged to belong to, is doing the work to decolonize gender identity and expand our understanding of of gender equity, and that it's not only inclusive of women and girls, but of all femme identified people, as well as uh, trans women and gender non-conforming folks. Lastly, there are tons of grassroots folks uh, throwing down in the streets right now as we speak, <laughs> doing direct action to confront institutions of power and stand in solidarity with women and families and organizations like the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health um, that I'm very proud that we've we've partnered uh, partnered with on some some stuff and, and sitting coalition coalition with on some stuff um, have been doing the policy work for a hella hella long to fight back against healthcare warfare, which is the uh, healthcare system being used as a weapon against black, brown, poor people and migrants. Well, thank you so much, Rose. If you'll hang on, we're gonna go through some housekeeping and then we're gonna to head to our Q&A. This is a reminder that, um, that we will have a Q&A at the end. So for folks who are uh, listening in live, you wanna make sure that you drop your questions in on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, there's a question tab, just type it in and we will ask the panelists at the end. Erin. All right, thank you, Pamela, and thank you to Rose. So and a strong encouragement to anyone watching this webinar to plug into our campaigns and sign up for our alerts at www.reproaction.org. You can follow us on social media. We are ReproAction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We have regular Act and Learn webinars every month. They are free. They are open to the public. As an intersectional reproductive justice organization, we're really proud to spotlight topics such as tonight's immigration is a reproductive justice issue. We also do trainings some months. And so these are really open and we want you to dig in and get involved in our movement. As we've seen with the news today, there's never been, and over the past week and months and frankly years, um, there's never been a more important time for you to get involved. So please do get involved with us. And then I also want to encourage you all to save the date for our next Repro Action Act and Learn webinar. And if you're signed up for our list, I promise you'll be getting an invitation. We'll be talking about, about a very important topic, abortion pill reversal, an unproven and unethical framework that's been developed by abortion opponents using primarily the bodies of low-income women of color for experimentation and it's not right, we're gonna dive in deep, talk about what's going on um, and how we can fight back. So please do save the date for Thursday, July 19th. That'll be taking place from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern and we're really excited about it. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Pamela to get us going on Q&A. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing questions dropped into the question tab. So if you do have a question, please just type it into the question tab and we will get it to our awesome panelists. I, of course, I'm gonna take advantage of this um, time to ask a couple of questions that um, that have been kind of swirling around in my head. Um, so moderator privilege, but please do share your questions um, while they're gonna answer mine. Um, so this one is, um, is, is kind of based on, you know, we are a media uh, society and we've talked about Twitter and social media and then, you know, broadcast news that the last three weeks have seemed to be um, a, a struggle to balance, you know, fact from fiction, but also just the overwhelming um, alarm of seeing some of the visuals and hearing some of the audio of what folks are experiencing um, in in detention and then trying to parse that with or balance that with you know what we can do to be helpful so I was wondering um, Margie if you could talk just a little bit about 
um, how people can navigate um, through some helpful resources. I, I definitely think um, that y'all, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health is a tremendous resource, um, but just how people can find um, where where they where they should be getting their information and where they should be looking for avenues to take action. Yeah, sure. Um, I can start and definitely want to hear from my fellow um, uh, presenters and see what their thoughts are as well. But I think really thinking about you know groups on the ground. There's been a lot of organizations right there doing this work for years on the ground, um, trying to secure immigrant justice for our communities. And so when I think about, um, you know, folks that are in the struggle right now, there's, you know, Raices in Texas, uh, who's had a lot of attention, earning a lot of well-deserved donations from across the country to do the important work that they're doing. Um, there's La Unión del Pueblo Entero, which is Lupe in the Rio Grande Valley, and I'll let Nancy speak more to this because she's more of the expert on that. But I think nationally, Rose was mentioning some of our, our comrades that are out there doing work right now, that are doing actions right now. Um, I see Mi Gente as a really huge leader in this work. Um, so they are someone that you should definitely be following. Um, their Twitter handle, I believe, is like Con Mi Gente, C-O-N. Mi gente, um, and you should definitely follow them on Twitter, on Facebook, and Instagram. They are constantly posting about actions that they are taking. Um, they'll be actually in San Diego, I believe, on July 2nd, so coming up. So if you're in that area, or you're close to that area, or you want to travel there, they're doing a massive um, action there that I think would be really helpful to either go to or help uplift. Um, so people like that, uh, organizations like United We Dream, I know that they just did a, a giant action in Tornillo, Texas, along with Mi Gente and um, the Workers' Families Parties and, and a lot of other organizations down there um, showing up and showing up in front of these detention centers. And I would really recommend people to go to those immigrant justice leaders in their local communities and, and to strategize together because I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people who want to do something, but we need to make sure that whatever we are doing is actually helpful for people that are being detained. So oftentimes people want to go and rally at a detention center and sometimes that actually causes harm to those that are detained, right? It might um, elicit a, a shutdown kind of lockdown situation inside the detention center, which we know is not good for the detainees. They'll suffer more abuses under the um, people that are ruling over there in those, in those centers. And so we want to make sure that we're going to the people who have been leading these fights so that you can strategically do something that's helpful right now. Thank you so much for that. Rose, um, Tina, or Nancy? Rose? Um, hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I would ditto a lot of what Margie said, to be honest. Um, you know, other groups are move on. Uh, folks can go on to familiesbelongtogether.com, and there's a list of over 650 actions that are happening all over the country this weekend. Um, there's a mass mobilization happening in DC, um, one tomorrow led by the Women's March, and one the following day led by Move On. Um, <clears throat> And um, as mentioned on, on the second, there's gonna be a huge mass mobilization in San Diego. There's one, hap one happening right now in Texas actually. Um, so yeah, I think, um, oh, I'll also add, and maybe this is something that can go out with the follow-up materials that Baji is working on, is, along with lots of other organizations have worked on this already, but uh, um, advocacy toolkit that will include um, some of these you know, actions and ways for folks to plug in. Thank you, that'd be great. Um, so I think I interrupted somebody. Was somebody trying to jump in? Um, it's Tina. I just I have maybe something that might be helpful. Um, I'm thinking of organizations that I turn to as a journalist to better understand ICE in particular. Um, and I'm thinking of Detention Watch Network, um, who for years has been tracking the detention system how ICE operates, how ICE gets to operate the way that it operates, the money that it gets from Congress. So sort of like understanding the nitty gritty of how ICE gets to behave so recklessly, I would definitely um, recommend looking at some of their research. Um, and then because of the executive order recently that will supposedly end family separation at the border, 
sort of the caveat to that is that the Trump administration is trying to do away with the Flores settlement, which are just very basic protections that children have in family detention. And we're also about to see family detention expand in ways um, that I think will be pretty unprecedented. So I'm thinking about, um, like, there are technically only, though, I mean, the tent cities and camps and those kinds of things that we're seeing emerge are, are, are the same thing. But there are technically only three family detention centers right now, one in Pennsylvania and two in Texas. And so I'm thinking of the Stop Burks Coalition, who's been trying to get the Burks uh, Family Detention Center closed for a few years now, and um, Grassroots Leadership in Texas, which has been doing a lot of work around the two family detention centers there, just sort of for the like context for understanding family detention, um, what it is, how it harms people, um, and then the ways in which we're likely going to see it expand. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is, um, I'm gonna give it to Nancy first. Um, this is um, from Crystal and a question about, um, currently working on a campaign and what are some good ways to bring um, their passion for these issues into the campaign to make sure they create actual change. Hi, Pamela. Um, would it be okay if you repeat the question? Of course. Um, so this is a question about working in a campaign and wondering if there's some ways to bring um, it like individual passion for these issues into a campaign space to make sure that they create actual change. Yeah, so um, I think when folks think about campaigns, they, there's, so basically there are a lot of ways to run a campaign. And in campaigns, usually it's incredibly helpful to have all sorts of types of people. So if you're incredibly interested in research, if you're an organizer, if you like to make noise and you know get people pumped up, there is always room for everyone to bring that talent into the space. Um, so for example, um, when it comes to the campaign um, for Eva Chavez who, uh, is the woman, um, the community leader here in the Rio Grande Valley, we really, we really utilized a lot of those folks. So we really utilized a lot of folks who brought a lot of noise and passion into accompaniment programs. Um, we alerted a lot of media folks. Um, and we also utilized a lot of people who had experience with deportation defense campaigns and um, with research. So when it came to Eva's campaign, we weren't just going to walk in and make some noise. I mean, we also wanted to prepare Eva as much as possible, which included um, signing power of attorney forms because a lot of folks don't realize that um, when you're deported, I mean, how are you going to access the money in your bank account? You need a power of attorney form to assign it to someone else to get that money for you. What's gonna to happen to your vehicle? It might be impounded because no one else can access your vehicle. And most importantly, if you have children, who is going to take custody of those kids um, if you do not have power of attorney forms settled? And so all of these factors were really important when it came to campaigns. And there are so many things that people can do around campaigns right now. And it isn't just about, you know, going to a rally and making noise. It's also about figuring out where the money is coming from. Because institutions like Southwest Key, the one that we saw, the vacant Walmart, are being housed out of Austin, Texas, and they're being funneled money by the city of Austin. And these institutions and these, you know, institutions that are cooperating with ORR or immigration exist everywhere. So it's also talking about running a campaign for permitting, you know, like a lot of the things that we were doing here in Texas was also stopping the permits from even happening to even open a detention center in the first place. And so basically there, there are just a lot of things that folks can bring to the table from all walks of life that will make campaigns incredibly successful. Thank you so much for that. I don't think we have time um, for another question um, because we pride ourselves at ReproAction for being super prompt when we begin and when we end. But thank you so much to our speakers, to Margie, to Nancy, to Tina, and to Rose. Thank you for lending your expertise and for your time tonight. This has been an incredible 
um, honor to learn from you. And thank you as always to my co-director for being awesome and to the entire ReproAction team. Um, you can visit us at reproaction.org and um, we are also ReproAction on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much. Take care and have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much.